I'll let you ask your questions and then you can go. Go ahead. The question was about sleep, how we heal most during sleep, and that's true, and what's the hours we need, but I want to say something in response to that question, that that will make you live longer if you finish dinner earlier, so when you go to sleep, you don't have food in your stomach. So it's more hours that you sleep without digesting food that makes you live longer. So whether you need five hours or eight hours, it could be variable based on your own individual needs. They say an average of six and a half to seven hours is what most people need, but some people need less. But what I'm saying to you right now is don't eat late at night and go to bed on a full stomach. That's the message. You'll sleep better, more healing will take place while you're sleeping, and you'll live longer. Yes? What do you recommend if you're allergic? I'll repeat the question anyway. Okay, I don't want to speak too loud. Not down, up. Um, what happens if you're allergic to nuts? What do you recommend? Well. We recommend we do testing to see what nuts you're most allergic to, so you can avoid those. And most people who are allergic to nuts can eat some seeds, like hemp seeds or pumpkin seeds. So there's other replacements. And, and so we got to do what, but over time, it's possible to improve your health enough through, healthy, through improving your immune system that you can pick some of the things you're le less allergic to. And through, through um, oral food challenge, with very tiny microscopic amounts, we could get you, your allergies to even improve. Okay, last question. Sorry, I, I think I'm out of time. Am I out of time, Steve? Okay, how many questions could I do? I keep going a little bit. Okay, I'll take five. I'll do five more minutes then. Okay, we can do we do five to ten more questions. Yes. I just want to ask you about lengthening telomeres with diet. You yes. mentioned that you can. Yes. The question was about lengthening telomeres with diet, and I'm telling you that when we do the telomere testing on people and they follow a nutritarian diet, their telomeres grow back, and they get lengthened. And it's remarkable. And we also can measure methylation defects today in modern medicine. And methylation defects accumulate to the point where you have cancer. And we see the methylation defects go back the other way, and people go from a high risk of cancer development to a low risk of cancer development as they follow the program. OK, yes. Thank you so much, Dr. Furman. Um, First, I, I just want to say that I'm a recovered compulsive overeater. I've kept off 85 pounds now for 15 years. Wow. All the women in my family have obesity problems, so um, it's possible. And my life is committed to helping other people do this now. So um, my question is this. Brenda Davis said that cooking beans over 360 degrees causes various, three different kinds of chemicals she mentioned. Dr. Greger said that if we boil our beans for 10 minutes, it gets rid of the lectins. Brian Clemens says that, you know, cooking at all uh, causes all kinds of chemicals. What does the science say science? in your experience? Okay. First of all, Thank um, you. the science is very clear that we cook beans in water as opposed to drying them out and baking them at high temperatures. It's not just beans. Any food you dry bake or grill or barbecue or flame broil, anytime you grill a food in the oven and make it brown or bake it, you're going to form acrylamides and other, and other dangerous compounds. That's not the case when you water cook foods in a stew, in a crock pot, or a soup. And beans we generally cook with water. And water cooked beans, their lectins are deactivated, except for the healthy ones that have better effect on building bones, that beneficial effects. And they've been shown to have lifespan benefits, strengthen the elderly with muscle mass retention in elderly people, and prevention against cancer. So it's a proven lifespan and cancer but the, way, but the question is a good question, because it's telling people that when you water base cook in a soup or a stew or a crock pot, the temperature can't get that high, because the water prevents the temperature from getting that high, and the moisture prevents burning from occurring and damaging effects. And Brenda Davis is a wonderful, oh, there she is right there. <laughs> she knows her stuff. And I didn't say, I, I was really trying to be clear 
that um, it's only dry heat that produces those compounds. That's why I was suggesting boiling. And you can easily do a um, instant pot or pressure cooking beans, and you're doing it in water. It's not a concern at all. You need to cook your beans well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thanks, Brenda. <laughs> See that? We got it right from the horse's mouth. OK. There's somebody. Right there, I see a hand right there. Okay. No person, just a hand. Could you tell me what we're eating? It's very good. What is it? <laughs> I think it's fried chicken cooked in maple syrup. They're trying to demonstrate the foods you shouldn't be eating. I have no idea, but I know one of these conferences I gave, they brought out pizza right after my lecture. They're bringing out pizza. And everyone in the audience, they just heard this lecture, and they're running up to get the pizza. I'm going to go, weren't you guys in attendance in this lecture? What were you, you know? Yes, go ahead. Yes. Blending, blending, in a, yes, OK. Uh, Not making the fats bioavailable like you do in oil? The question is, when you blend something, like blending nuts, are you making the fat more bioavailability, like with oil? Well, you're not removing the beneficial compounds and fibers. They're still there. It's almost like chewing them well, you know? You see, this person just said, what about cardiovascular disease, increasing risk, endothelial inflammation? See, he's been kind of like heard this inflammation in this information and he believes it to be true that something about the fat or the oils can cause endothelial inflammation it's just not true there's no such you you know it's true when you have heated oils yes but those studies are um, there's no never been a study that showed that nuts cause endothelial inflammation no matter how much oil is consumed or fats consumed matter of fact it shows the opposite the eating of nuts increases vascular elasticity and has anti-inflammatory effects and facilitates the absorption of anti-inflammatory compounds. There's no damage from blending a nut because you're not increasing the glycemic effect because they're non-glycemic to begin with. Okay. Yes. What about what about okay. the foods that are imported that are irradiated? Um, you know, they still can have the organic. My understanding is they can still say organic and yet they've been irradiated, like nuts coming from another country or berries coming from Mexico or whatever. You know, how are they treating them to get them in here, even with the organic label, and then are they still worth eating? Yeah, you know, I, you know, food can be, there's different varieties and qualities of the food we eat. And a, f a food like that may still be very healthy and good for you compared to not eating it, but it may not be as healthy as food grown in better soil, you know, so, like, there's certain graduations of quality in the food. Like, for example, organic food is really good, but there's food that's even better than organic, that's grown in better quality soil, maybe in your home garden. Maybe you used earthworm castings and wet guano and mineral rock and, and, and fresh forest compost, and maybe you made a more richer soil with a better microbiome and worm density, and you can get even better food. But so do the best you can. And I do recommend people garden a lot and grow some of their own food in the really great soil so you have some mix with that. You know what I mean? But most nuts, though, don't forget, they've come from trees that grow 40 feet into the ground. They're very tall. They're in sealed shells. You're hard to get pesticides on them. The radiation or whatever they're doing them to reduce mold or whatever is relatively minor compared to the sprays used on other foods and the chemicals in animal products and in processed foods, that's where you're really getting the endocrine disruptors and exposure to chemicals, not in a little bit of ra food radiation from the food. The fear of radiation is really blown out of proportion. You can overcook a food in a microwave, but it's not going to radiate the food. It's not going to damage your food. It's not like radiating your body with radiation. So you're really blowing something out of proportion. Okay, yes. Yeah, back. Wait for the mic. Wait for the mic. The question is about soy. You eat what? Pente? Tempe. The question was, what about soy, organic soy, and does soy raise IGF-1 because it's high in protein? I'll say three things. Number one, 
if we look at all the studies on beans and their effect on cancer, it looks that most of the studies that look at this issue seem to reflect that the consumption of soy has the most protection against cancer compared to any other bean. I think it's because of the effect that the genistein blocks the estrogen receptor in the breast tissue, so any self-produced estrogen is blocked from stimulating breast tissue. Now, the most favorable way to consume soy, of course, is tempeh or edamame or dried soybeans that are reconstituted in a soup because it's not highly processed. So non-processed soy is the most anti-cancer protection because all the fiber and all the features of the soy are there, present, in the tempeh, in the soybean, and in the edamame. As we take it and remove the fiber and make soy milk out of it and tofu out of it, it's not going to be perhaps as cancer protective. As we process it more and make it into isolated soy protein and soy foods, then you result with a problem because then it could have negative effects on IGF-1 and you're also losing the beneficial anti-cancer effects of the food. So to sum that up, your tempeh is okay. Okay? Dr. Furman? Okay. Hi, Dr. Furman? Yes. You raised your hand for your friend. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. Oh, there's somebody. Oh, Steve's out there giving away yeah. hanging around the microphone. I got one. Okay. Okay, oh, ahead. Just speak loud. Steve. I'll repeat the question. Well, hold on. To, to get it on video, we have to get it on. Oh, it's on video. Thank you. I if I knew it was on video, I would have answered the questions differently. <laughs> You carry me around with you. Wow, that's funny. That's, that's really good. Hi, Dr. Furman. Are you that person in front of my house in that van looking at me with those binoculars? No, no, no. <laughs> okay. Oh, okay. I'm just teasing you. Okay. Yes. I have a question about fat. Okay. Dr. Thomas uh, Seyfried was here, and he spoke about cancer, the metabolic cause of cancer, and on his pyramid, Yes. He said that fat was the most, the largest percentage of your diet. The fat was the largest percentage of his diet, not of my diet. Yes, 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 I agree okay. with that. Okay. Okay. So I had asked another speaker, uh -huh. what would she recommend for good fat? And I said to her, nuts, would that be a good fat? I was curious what she'd say. And she said... Fat is fat. Now, we know that's erroneous. So I would like to Whatever ask... What that means. Yeah, right. In other words, she was saying... I'm oh, just teasing. I'm just kidding. I know. Isn't that ridiculous? Yes. I think that was ridiculous. So um, my question to you is what do you recommend as good fats besides nuts and seeds? You know, good question. And keep in mind that you're going to hear lots of speakers up here. You've got to have a discern, discerning mind to figure out what you think is real and supported by the literature. And when, when people are, you know, where the lecturers are coming together want to agree on things that are well supported and where they're not, and to be able to filter out the nonsense from the real things that are valuable. You know, okay, let me answer that question. Whatever it was. <laughs> I'm only recommending nuts and seeds as your source of fat. I'm not recommending any oil be included in the diet. Is that good enough? No oil, because oil is a processed food. Now, it's easy to overeat calories from fat. Because we can make us too fat, make us give us too many calories. So we're not going to have the oil plus the nuts and seeds. We want to choose one or the other. Nuts and seeds are, have much more health-giving effects than oil. Would you want to eat walnut oil or walnuts? Pecan oil or pecans? Sesame oil or sesame seeds? You want the whole fiber, the whole bioflavonoids, the whole sterols. You want all the beneficial pieces in the whole food. Right. But nuts, avocado, but nuts and seeds have, seem to have more beneficial and nutrient levels than avocado does. So avocado is okay, but that shouldn't be the major source of your fat. You're better off having that be minor and having more nuts and seeds. Then it depends on your caloric needs and your body weight and how many calories are right for you. We don't want to overshoot your calories, but it seems that about half an ounce of nuts and seeds are necessary to maximally absorb the beneficial fatty nutrients from the meal you just ate. Now, 
should I have my nuts and seeds as a snack between meals? Should I have them with my breakfast oatmeal? Or should I have them with my lunch salad or with my dinner wokt veg with my dinner soup? Where, where should I eat those nuts and seeds? At what part of the day? When should I eat them? Does this person said anywhere? Right. That's right. You should eat them with the meals and with the vegetable meals, particularly with the meal with the biggest salad. Right? Because you want to get maximum absorption of those anti-cancer nutrients in the raw vegetables. Yes? Thank you. Uh, thanks, Dr. Furman. Uh, very informative. Question I have is, <clears throat> there's been a lot of discussion, yeah, controversy people, around people, diabetes, people. type 1, type 2. So in your opinion, or scientifically, can you actually reverse type 1 diabetes? The question was, just to make it clear and louder, that he's insinuating that type 2 diabetes can be easily reversed. And I have to say that at my retreat and my practice, we promise people they can reverse a type 2 diabetes. It's almost always the case. It's very, very rare that we don't have a type 2 diabetic become non-diabetic. That would be exceedingly rare. It would be like a type 1 and a half who's so advanced they don't reverse. They must always get better. Now, the type 1 is harder to reverse and usually does not reverse. But I personally have had some cases of children come to me right when they were newly diagnosed with type 1 diabetes at the age of 4 or 5 years old, and I have some cases that totally reverse themselves. I have personally cared for type 1 diabetes who don't have diabetes anymore at all. And I'm publishing those, put them into a little series, and we're putting and publishing them in a medical journal shortly. So you're also saying... But I'm saying that once the diabetes exists mm -hmm. for years, the beta cells have been destroyed and they're not going to grow back. Can stem cell treatment be a, a possible... It may be that 10 years from now, when we've, when we've um, perfected that idea of stem cells being able to grow back the beta cells in the pancreas, right. which hasn't been perfected yet, right. I think that that could be something that might happen in the, in the future, that we'd be able to help type 1 diabetics through stem cells grow back the beta cells that have been destroyed, but that's not yet available in the technology we have now. Okay, thank you. Yes. Okay, why don't we just do two more questions then? Oh, okay, one, two. One, two. One, go ahead. Yes. And I'm choosing you guys because you had your hands up the longest. The other people put them down, put them back up again. You kept up the whole time, so I picked you. So there's been explanations about the, uh, the need of adequate cholesterol. And on your diet, um, what, are the, what are the levels that you achieve and what is the source for, for cholesterol? Because usually it's saturated fat from coconuts or whatever. Do you need that, or can you get it in some other way? Do you know what the cholesterol level is of animals like elephants and chimpanzees and gorillas and monkeys? Do you know where the average cholesterol runs? No idea. I know you have no idea. You wouldn't ask the question. The average cholesterol of most, of most animals in the wild runs very, very low, like between 40 and 70. You know, very, very low. You don't need much cholesterol. The body makes all it needs. It doesn't need very much. This idea that you need to eat saturated fat to have a higher cholesterol is fabricated by the people pushing animal products and by the paleo people. It's nonsense. The body makes the cholesterol it needs. If it needs more, it'll make more. You don't have to eat cholesterol. You don't have to eat something to drive up your cholesterol. There's plenty of precurtain in the body, and there's plenty of fats in the, you know, we want your diet to be fat adequate. That's why we're having some nuts and seeds in it anyway. And those, and will, those will convert to, con, to cholesterol. Your body will make the mechanism. cholesterol it needs when your diet is a healthy diet. You don't okay. need to eat cholesterol or saturated fat. By the way, there is some saturated fat in low amounts in nuts and seeds, right? Even olive oil is 14% saturated, by the way. Okay. It's well, not as high as coconut oil. I'm not recommending it, but there is some saturated fat present, and low amounts of saturated fats that are naturally present in nuts and seeds are not an issue. But nor do we have to think that we have to eat high amounts from getting in animal products either, which is that which people are advocating on a paleo diet. You've got to have the cholesterol. You've got to have the cholesterol. So in a blood test, what's, a, what's an adequate range of cholesterol, total cholesterol? I don't think you should think about what the adequate range is. You should, your, your LDL cholesterol should be below 100. You can't be, can't be too low. If your body's lowering it to that level without medication, you can just leave, let it be where it goes. Okay. Don't be worried about it being too low. Yes. Thank you. Sure. Okay, great. Um, I have friends who try to go plant-based 
and uh, claim that after doing so, they don't feel that great, so then they revert back. Can you speak to the, some of the common mistakes that people make when they're trying to go plant-based that may lead to them not feeling so well? Yes. The number one problem is that, they, that when they start to eat a healthy diet and get rid of the animal products, all the extra nitrogenous, nitrogenous wastes, ammonia, urea, uric acid, are dumped into circulation, and they feel fatigued and wiped out. And it can take them even a month to get over that. So most of it is that they've got to give it a full month because they're dumping too much nitrogen back in their tissues. That they're dumping waste products out, and they're feeling ill because of the waste dumping, which means they're getting healthier, and they're feeling bad because of the detox. That's the number one reason. The second reason is because of DHA, is, is could be due to deficiencies, particularly of DHA, fat, that affects brain function. That's when people get depressed and anxious on a nutritarian diet, on a, on a, on a vegan diet, let's say. There's DHA deficiencies. There are some people, though, who require more protein. And sometimes their vegan diet doesn't give them enough taurine and enough amino acids in general. And those people do better by eating, you know, um, sunflower seeds and edamame and hemp seeds and quinoa and green vegetables. And they, they need their diet designed, to, their vegan diet designed to have adequate protein. In. Because just a common vegan diet, they're eating mostly rice and potatoes and macrobiotic. It wasn't enough protein for them, especially they're used to eating a high protein diet. So we got to have the vegan diet be more protein adequate. So it's usually protein adequacy, deep fatty acids, and it could be deficiencies of B12, zinc, iodine, and DHA, but the DHA is the most common deficiency because most people on a vegan diet already know it's low in B12 and they're probably taking B12. So it's usually what they're missing is usually more, and zinc is what's not going to, the zinc, effects of zinc deficiency on a vegan diet wouldn't show its effect till many, year, till many years, of, till they're older or something, if they were a poor zinc absorber. So it's mostly DHA that's going to have its effect in a few, you know, but that's usually going to take, to become DHA deficient, it would also probably take a couple of years to become DHA deficient. What's that? You wouldn't expect that right away then? You wouldn't affect it right away. If it's a, it's a, if it's a year in, two years in, it's more fatty acid DHA. If it's right away, it's more dumping, de detoxing. And if it's intermediate, you know, if it's not one of those two things, then it probably is they need more protein. They design the, pro design the diet accordingly to be higher in protein. Sure. Okay. We're done. Thank you.